crypto is fairly small today. Uh, yeah. Where there's maybe a couple hundred million people that actually hold crypto on mm -hmm. kind of exchanges, but very few people, uh, maybe low millions that are doing things on chain today. Being kind of a decentralized protocol that you are, how do you kind of think about that marketing or even just effective communication? Okay, Z, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Uh, super excited to be doing this one. Uh, we've been working together for a while now, but excited yeah, to get you on months, the podcast. Yeah, six months, right? I know. It's been over it's six been months. Pretty wild. Yeah. But thank you for doing this. Uh, super excited and really looking forward to the conversation. You're the head of growth at Orca, and that is a big role. Before we kind of get into Orca, what you're specifically doing, I would love just to learn a little bit of how you got into the industry. I think you kind yeah. of took a circuitous path. Uh, so I'd love to start there. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me, Logan. And um, I do want to do a shout out to uh, Milan, who was a very integral member of the team, who listened to your podcast and came to me and said, we got to catch this guy before he became, he like blows up, it becomes really big. Um, so, so he prompted me to reach out to you and uh, chat with Legend and, and form this super meaningful partnership. Um, so a little bit about me and how I got into crypto. Um what day is it today? It's June, right? June 5th or something like that. June 5th, 2023. Yeah. So um, just a little over two years ago, I knew literally nothing about crypto. Um, so the first time I heard about crypto was actually from Ori's goodbye email uh, that was sent around to IDEO. So me and Ori used to work together uh, at this design consultancy. Uh, it kind of made its name for making, you know, the first scalable uh, Apple mouse, um, like over 30 years ago now. And it's kind of like a leader for using design thinking as a way to provide consulting services. Um, so we, we kind of met there many years ago when she was working uh, in the Tokyo studio and I was working in the Shanghai studio. And we kind of met at like a leadership training. So we kept in touch uh, on and off. And then I received this email that she sent to the team and said, hey, I'm going to go build my own thing now. Um, it's this thing called Orca, you know, et cetera. And I was like, oh, what is that? So then I messaged her. I was like, what is this thing? And then she gave me all these words that I didn't understand. <laughs> and then she was like, oh, well, actually, you know, we have a uh, we're trying to build our team and we are looking for a community manager that speaks Chinese. Do you want to do that? Because like China is like a big, um, a, has a big community for crypto. Um, and I was like, no, I don't know anything about crypto, so I won't be able to manage any community. Uh, and then, so, so we left it at that. And then two months later, uh, she messaged me and she said, hey, we, we actually have this role. Um, it doesn't require any knowledge in crypto yet. You can learn as you kind of get up to speed. Uh, and it's more of a, uh, the title at the time was called Chief of Staff. Um, there was only um, three other people uh, after I, so I joined as a fourth person. So it was um, Ori, Utaro, and Timok, who was our uh, first dev. So uh, I was mainly taking over a lot of the operational back of office things um, and help kind of organize the business itself while they focus on kind of uh, launching the product. Because uh, back then it was May of 2021. And Orca had just gone mainnet for, I think it was less than three months. And uh, there were just a lot of opportunities coming in. And we had to think about uh, the real plight of running a, a small business, a startup. Yeah, Orca, I think people forget how early Orca was in the Solana ecosystem. Uh, really one of the first and amazing just kind of your recant of history and being able to be at the ground floor on such a important project as of Orca uh, on a high throughput blockchain like Solana. Uh, stars really aligned there. Yeah, kind of like dove into the big end, uh, the deep end without knowing anything at all um, and kind of learned from like a really, really niche, but very important corner of DeFi and like kind of expanding from there to learn about crypto in general. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I would love to kind of ask you the question as the head of growth for Orca, what the fuck is a head of growth and how would you kind of describe that role? 
Yeah. So I, I, I ask myself that I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Right. Like on a day to day basis. Um, I think, I think there's a lot of variations, um, of head of growth. Um, and I think this title, uh, may or may not stay the same as, as my role also evolves in, in Orca. So, um, there are a few examples I think that comes to mind when one thinks about head of growth. So some might think they are driving community growth. Right. So like really growing engagement in the community and growing maybe the number of users. Right. Some people might link head of growth more to a BD role um, and playing like an integral role of looking at the ecosystem and thinking how different products can compose on each other and, you know, compose on Orca. And uh, for Orca, one of its pay, uh, main audiences may be like asset listing and how uh uh, projects with tokens can list on Orca and therefore kind of boost growth in that way. Um, some people might think about marketing um, and how we can grow our, our brand presence. Um, so I do a little bit of all of those things, um, but actually my uh, I've been very lucky to have recruited people and have trained people to be experts on each of those things. Um, and something that I do that may not be super Typical when you think of uh, the role of head of growth is to think about um, the growth of people because people is really the core of everything that, that 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 grows right. Literally, you need a person to think about how to do BD. You need a person to think about how to do marketing. You need a person to calm a fud in the community and communicate with them, and you need people who are thinking about how to find the, these humans, um, put them in the right places, and what are the next big challenge uh, that Orca should be tackling once the vision is set? How does it come into fruition? And who are the right teams to be put together uh, to, to be on that task force for like the next, um, the next path or the next step of Orca's, Orca's um, development? Uh, so I... That might have sounded super vague, um, but I, I think whatever it is I do, I always try to keep in mind um, how do you ultimately grow Orca as a protocol uh, and not just like a specific uh, facet, which are all very important, but someone needs to kind of like lump it together. 100%. And maybe I think kind of having the perspective that you do now, kind of working previously in the design space in the Web2 world, kind of uh, more human-centered design focus there, and then kind of coming into the Web3 crypto world, uh, what are some of the big things that you've seen just from an operational standpoint, even marketing side, that you would say is like completely different or ultimately the same uh, in these two industries? Mm. Um, I think the biggest similarity is that both of these indus industries uh, and its people uh, need to learn how to operate in ambiguity or like need to learn how to deal with a lot of external factors that uh, one cannot predict. Um, so in the design world, there's a lot of innovative technology that come out uh, from different places. And you have to think about how to kind of turn that technology into a, uh, a usable product that people might enjoy or a usable experience. Um, and uh, for my previous role at IDEO, it was a lot of kind of um, aligning what the client is looking for and what a designer, a more creative uh, and, and very innovative individual might want to build uh, and then kind of find that synergy. So the designer feels like they've built something meaningful and also the client has walked away feeling like they, they actually obtained something meaningful, which you know, it sounds like these are the same things, but um, two people will find value in, in vastly sometimes opposite uh, things. Um, and then in crypto, there are a lot of external factors. Just last year, we've experienced a lot of those ourselves um, being a part of the Solana ecosystem. And also, uh, as different technology develop, as new players come in, um, what we have maybe believed before as uh, the most innovative piece of tech to create or, um, you know, the, the least saturated space to play in uh, will no longer be that within like a much shorter time frame than any other industry. So we need to be very good at embracing ambiguity 
and learning to to always uh, adapt to constant change, which is actually very difficult for when you're trying to hire because your needs keep changing. Um, and and one day you're hiring for uh, someone that could you know write. Uh, may, maybe develop a mobile app in the next day. You know, we may not be making that anymore. We have to hire someone different. Yeah, I mean, even the, all the ups and downs within crypto are extraordinary from kind of the cyclical nature of crypto to yeah. even some of the things that have happened with Solana and some of its downtime. Uh, and as you said, like the constant kind of like pivoting or just reprioritizing, you really need someone extremely flexible that's kind of just willing to get their hands dirty and dive into the details. That's uh, no easy task. Yeah, um, it's difficult to it's difficult to be that person, or maybe some people thrive in that environment, right? Uh, I will say um, Ori and Utaro, both of their roles have changed. Also, Tmoc, because um, that's the four of us when we started, um, but all of their roles have changed a lot uh, throughout the last two years of building Orca. Um, Ori has always been kind of spearheading the design and the human-centered piece of our product. Um, but she has also taken on a variety of different roles. Uh, she is the one that ingrained um, the Climate Fund into our DNA. And she's the one that supported the Climate Fund being its own working group. And now another team member is uh, kind of leading that. And she, we just had a call today where we're talking about how to build a stronger culture a stronger synergy within within our team when everyone is distributed um, like across time zones and across the globe. So that is arguably, it is an extension of being human centered, but it wasn't, uh, you know, the UI UX design and the front end developer role that she had when we first started. Um, and then Utaro as well, kind of uh, coming more like front stage and um, doing that interview with you and going to be uh, on stage doing a presentation in New York's Hacker House. And she, uh, he has also uh, really changed his role and grown a lot as Orca has adapted. Um, yeah, and, and, and myself, I kind of, I started with back office and then moving over to, so community was the first piece of front-facing work that I did at Orca. And then gradually moving to also marketing, uh, some ecosystem partnerships, some long-term BD, uh, some relationship stuff, uh, working with our investors, um, and kind of now looking at like a more holistic, um, like looking at work in a more holistic way. Yeah. Yeah. But then no. the the harder thing is hiring for people who are equally flexible, um, but may not have shared the same piece of history of a startup. Um, as the as the starting team members and you really i mean as you mentioned have been involved in orca since the beginning uh employee number four how big is the team today and how has kind of been scaling the organization or kind of the decentralized infrastructure that you're building uh been throughout that journey yeah so um currently so the initial development team is around uh, 20 folks, give or take. Um, but if we think about all contributors, including community team, uh, dev advocates, and all of these people who, who really came through, a lot of them are were just community members helping out. Um, we have around uh, 30 people. Um, and there are also other types of contributors. For example, uh, Reverie is a team that, a uh, team of uh, I think three to five people, but two of them work very closely with Orca. So they've been a part of Orca's uh, DAO design process since I think it was early, early last year. Uh, and they helped Orca's initial development team think about how to structure uh, the DAO, uh, how to recruit for council members. So uh, now the council is in place. And if we count the seven council members we have today, we have 30 plus. So it just depends on how you think about the makeup of Orca's team. Um, yeah, so so it's, it's really been a really rapid growth uh, journey for the past two years because starting from, yeah, just the four of us to now like 30 plus uh, humans and 30 plus voices. A lot of them are very smart. They have opinions. So it's also balancing that um, and hoping that we all move in the right direction. Yeah. 
It, it is remarkable. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, just being able to scale that organization as the head of growth through these kind of turbulent times, whether it's the cyclical nature, the ups and downs, being able to change for hiring, it's, it is quite a bit. And you have uh, no easy kind of job in front of you. Uh, initially, you, kind of at the beginning of the podcast, you named some high-level categories, uh, kind of whether it's the strategy, the operations, even the human-centered part of kind of building out that team in this organization. Can you talk about uh, breaking down each of those and kind of how you think about kind of running uh, these decentralized organization and managing kind of all the moving parts within it? Yeah. Um, the first thing I will say is um, more often than not, it doesn't go how you expect it to go. Um, so, so let's just start there. Um, my, my journey has not really gone exactly where I imagined um, myself to be. I think um, I've always been more of like a general management uh, type of person, uh, but exactly applying that skill to like which industry, to which organization or any of that, uh, uh, let alone to like a decentralizing organization, I didn't really think about um, where where I will bring my skills. Um, but so, so each of the parts, um, not all of these things are the things I'm currently doing, um, but these are all important, I would say, components uh, when you think about protocols like a sustainable growth. So I think this portion that I'll mention um, is actually not a portion I touch. So Orca at its core is a product-led organization, right? So um, who is the one that is developing the product, you know, interviewing the users, um, and then kind of turning that into a smart contract, front end, um, how to make sure it's audited, it's fixing it based on the audit, all of that. So that is the job of uh, engineering and, and the product team. So this is, I would say, uh, a very, very critical, most critical component, uh, but everything else would be wrapping around the product and the vision of the product. So, um, what I try to do is to facilitate every step of execution once the product vision is clear. So the product vision is clear. The engineering team is taking that and running with it. Um, so what I will do is I will work with, um, it could be Ori, it could be a different team member, um, to think about what this product is meant to represent. What are we telling uh, this target audience how this product, uh, this product's uh, value proposition, right? So we have the value proposition down and then I will work with our marketing team um, and think about, okay, this is how we will come, this is what we will say, this is one sentence. How are we gonna say it in a hundred different ways? And who are we gonna say it to? And who are the existing uh, partners or like new partners we should be forming alliances with that can help us say that better? So that will go into more kind of marketing strategy and marketing planning and execution. So then we have that. Um, go ahead. Maybe just touching on that point, I think crypto is fairly small today uh, yeah. where there's maybe a couple hundred million people that actually hold crypto on mm -hmm. kind of exchanges, but very few people, uh, maybe low millions that are doing things on chain today, being kind of a decentralized protocol that you are. How do you kind of think about that marketing or even just effective communication with uh, the users that are using the product today, whether that's on Twitter or, or doing the partnerships with BD? There's many different avenues. And I think in large part, people are within crypto and outside of crypto are still trying to figure it out. And so as someone that's been involved in an early project that's been successful, how, how do you personally think about it? Mm -hmm. Is your question more around how to position Orca's product or is your question more around um, what will happen to the, the users? Like what kind of users will we bring in for crypto in the future? I, I think more broadly, like what are the big things that you have learned just in your role from like a communication standpoint? Do you feel like it's the most effective to communicate with Twitter? I feel like that's quite uh, the town square that everybody hangs out of. As easy to use as Orca is, and, and Orca 
is now even more easy, uh, easier than before because of orca, uh, the new Orca. Um, it is not the best position as a onboarding tool um, because people need, first of all, there needs to be uh, enough people that want to trade native tokens on Solana, right? And then uh, they need to have a wallet and know what a wallet is. And I think those two steps, we have X'd out a bunch of, you know, a lot of humans uh, as we stand today. So we kind of quickly realized that in order for Orca to become successful, it's more about building alliances with um, projects who can onboard um, and also projects who will uh, build more towards educating their users to learn a bit more about, about uh, Solana or about uh, whatever Orca's next product might be. So take the new Orca, uh, for example, um, we, it was a very intentional choice for us to do a partnership with Dialect because Dialect is a project that has decided to be very mobile forward and very retail user forward. And um, the users, I remember, I think Mark from Dialect telling us that they have 100,000 users on the wait list trying to use Dialect. So that is 100,000, maybe not all of that are new users, but a lot of those are untapped by Orca. So by choosing to do a collaboration with them, we are trying to get these new crypto curious users uh, who may just want to do, may just want to play around with a, with a fun sticker, right? To learn about another easy to use product that is Orca that might exist, uh, that, that exists by the time they want to maybe make a trade. So um, the nature of Orca's product uh, is more sitting comfortably between the crypto curious and the super DeFi savvy. Um, and those are the two extremes uh, in our spectrum that we want to align with to bring more users from those two ends over to Orca. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. The partnerships at this point, especially when the industry is so nascent, everybody kind of is growing the pie together. And by collaborating on the business development side, by kind of working together, tapping into each other's communities, it's much more positive sum than kind of taking out the knives at such an early stage. Uh, it, definitely, I would say the right mentality to try to uh, continue to bring people on in the space. Yeah. And this kind of came um, after we've made different, you know, attempts and made different mistakes uh, or like different realizations. So for example, one of the investments that we made last year or the year before, um, might've been last year, uh, was to invest in Solana Spaces, for example. Uh, that was going to be the first ever retail or retail space for a blockchain. And there was one actually we, here in Miami, uh, which yeah. was a cool place to check out. I was surprised Lana kind of took the initiative to do it. Yeah, yeah. So I think Vibu received a, a grant from the foundation to to build this thing and uh, married like his previous experience in uh, building like real life activations and retail concepts. Um, and we were very excited to be invited to be a part of this. And we thought, oh, you know, this could really allow us to tap into new retail users. Um, we invested, we spent a lot of time, we built uh, like activations on their device um, and we tried to co co collaborate and promote. Um, but what we ended up realizing is that um, people who are walking um, at Hus like, you know, around Hudson Yard or walking uh, around Wynwood, right, in, in Miami, um, they're more excited about uh, PFPs. They're more excited about, you know, buying an NFT and, you know, ha you know that is, you know, representing uh, one animal or another. Uh, they're more excited about buying a pair of shoes that are really fun in their color, you know, buying a plushie. Um, they may they may trade on Orca. They may learn how to trade on Orca using the, the tutorial that we put together. Um, but they will probably walk away remembering the NFTs a bit more. Um, and that's also an experience that <laughs> helped us learn that maybe going direct to retail isn't the best move for Orca. It's amazing what the NFT community has done for kind of the onboarding of retail. Yeah. And I think I was kind of blown away by the uptick of 
how popular it became in culture in 2021. Uh, it felt like you cannot walk down the street without seeing some NFT branding or someone talking about NFTs. I think the pendulum has swung a little bit back the other way today. But that being said, it still did a tremendous amount for kind of our community and just getting people excited and things that maybe are a little bit more complicated or just people are free to do where uh, trading pictures of things that people resonate with kind of uh, is a little easier for them to grasp. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's feature rap songs. So that's like, I mean, that's my definition of making it. I don't know about <laughs> yours. Um, yep. I love Little Bubble. Uh, if you listen to Little Bubbles, like kind of uh, rap songs and, and also mainstream rap artists. But anyways, I think if we think about NFT as an art form, which I, I do, um, some some people may not think so, or some people may not even think television is an art form, and I also uh, uh, disagree with them. Um, I think art is always more progressive than um, kind of the, the norm, right? If you think about like an adoption curve, like artists, um, people who think in more abstract terms, they usually are way ahead of many others. Um, and then the early adopter segment is what comes like quite a bit later uh, by like maybe one order of magnitude. Um, so I think... For crypto, a lot of people, a lot of artists saw opportunity and created, and um, and I think the 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 speed has expedited a lot in crypto, where people, where you can you can commercialize NFTs, you can commercialize it so much faster than like a, a piece of painting in, in in traditional art. So people are now trading on it, but maybe it will take a little bit longer before um, that becomes more widely adopted um, not just as NFT or flipping, but, but thinking about the applications on, uh, on blockchain as application that you can use in everyday life. But I think that's okay. We're here early and uh, Orca, just like a lot of other protocols are trying to build for a future where it is more mainstream. And um, we, are, we are quite patient uh, as far as crypto protocols go. No, I love it. And on the topic of building, uh, being a decentralized organization, you're not located in one place. As you mentioned, there's contributors, there's multiple different people that help grow the ecosystem that is Orca. How do you think about kind of the operations from that? I, I think earlier you said that uh, you often don't get what you want, but from a kind of global world standpoint, I think this is much different than kind of a company that would be all in the same room organizing. Is that a difficult task? Uh, is it harder to ship products? What have you kind of learned from your experience? Yeah. Um, so I will say my statement was you don't always get what you expected or something like that. Right. Uh, but a lot of times the outcome can be better than what you expected. Um, and, and I think that's what I've, I've really enjoyed about being a part of Orca. So yes, uh, organizing a decentralizing organization is difficult. There are a lot of opinions and there are people, and I mean, can the devs do something, right? That's what you hear from community members all the time. The truth is the devs are always trying to do something, but maybe just not exactly what they want the devs to be doing. Um, and, and, and that's just one, one example um, I think in crypto where the relationship between the developing team and the community is so close, it's much closer than any, like if, if any token, if any, any protocol launches a token, um, it has another added component of community, right? It has token holder, it has the users of the protocol and it has, uh, builders, it has, uh, uh, in, a, in a sense of Orca, it has liquidity providers and asset listers, a lot of different types of audiences. And um, they sometimes have tensions to be held between what they each want. Um, it, is, it is difficult. One thing I will say is um, hiring from the community or like bringing in contributors from the community. And, and here, when I say community, I mean Discord. Is very very helpful. So uh, currently, Orca's head of BD uh, was a longtime contributor in Orca's Discord community for a long time. 
uh, many, many months and uh, they entered into kind of like poem competitions that we threw in the community for engagement purposes. Uh, and that's kind of how we started a conversation with him. Um, and uh, Orca's current community lead was just walking around, I mean, virtually in the community, answering questions, being helpful, uh, who was based in uh, Brazil. Um, and none of our other team members or contributors are based in Brazil. And it just so happened that this person was, you know, like having some downtime at work and, and, and answering. And then uh, Orca's deaf advocates, two of them both came from the community. And I think having these individuals who kind of are kind of marinating or bathing in the community and hearing what they want and what their plight are is very important because they become better at um, communicating with them. They become better at communicating uh, the community's needs to the development team. And that does make a very big impact on the product. Um, so I think it's difficult, but being very... Being empathetic is something you always have to, it's a muscle that you always have to flex and to practice and always having differing opinions kind of shared back, shared in with the development team is helpful for practicing that muscle. And of course, on the design and development side, uh, the, the product team is always speaking to community members, is looking to speak with them from the Discord is looking to, we, we kind of uh, source interviewees from different NFT communities, depending on the nature of the product we want to build next. Um, so, so there's a lot of listening going on. It makes the process a bit slower, right? Because when there are different opinions, uh, there is a lot of diverging and converging to decide what to build next. Um, and, and also just like how to answer one question. Sometimes you answer it incorrectly, it could create a lot of discontent. Um, so listening to the community and just making them believe that um, you, you are genuine and wanting to listen to them, is, it makes a world of difference. Uh, one example would be, I think when I, when I first started to do community, it was maybe February of last year. And this is when, this is still like, this is like DeFi was still popping back then. Right. So like lots of new tokens being listed, some of them good, some of them not so great. Some of them are soft rugs. Right. Uh, and one of the tokens was slow rugging and it created a lot of discontent uh, within Orcus community. Um, a lot of them were, I, I mean, they were upset because their, their token prices are depreciating in value or losing value very rapidly. They're looking for someone to blame. They're looking to blame anyone. Right. Could be Orca. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I think back then, uh, Orca was only in the beginning of building like a strong culture in the community. So every, I think for like a week or two weeks in the morning at like 6 a.m., I would jolt awake because like some, one of the community team members from a different time zone would be like, Kito, like this happened again. Like this person is like fighting again, creating like a huge storm of like negative comments. Like, what should we do? Um, and then it was a lot of like, talking to some of these people individually and, uh, and, and, and writing along messages. And something I found was there was this one community member that was very, very angry. Um, and then I, I did some <laughs> detective work and I like looked up like, I think six month back date to their Twitter. And I realized like six months ago when Orca, uh, it wasn't too long after Orca just launched, this person sent a tweet and said, Oh, this is the best UX ever. I love this product. I'm going to like use this and never use any product ever again. So I think finding that tweet made me realize that this person is probably angry because they really liked Orca and they were disappointed in some way. Like they, something that they trusted in from their perspective, maybe did them wrong, but it came from a place of trust. It came from a place of, of, um, of endearment. Um, so I think that taught me how to be more empathetic when it, when it's talking, when, when it comes to talking to a community member, because they're here and they're sharing their voice because they want to be heard by, by you, by Orca. And, and that's actually something we should treasure. So yeah. that's a part of it. And another one is, um, um, Orca's, Maybe Orca's council. In, in, in terms of, I mean, Orca has a vibrant community. It's been involved in the beginning. I think 
Web3 is so tightly entwined, as you mentioned, with the community aspect. You mentioned Discord as well. How important has kind of been the Discord to kind of cultivating this like very vibrant community that you built? And how do you, you also mentioned that on the product and feedback, you regularly work with the community. How, how is that relationship and how have you kind of built it up over time? Um, so how do we build it up over time? Um, I think one thing going back to before is um, I think a lot of the very helpful community members are now either on the community team contributing or a part of the dev advocate team. Um, so I think that alone is bridging the relationship between the community and the development team. There are things where they can all come together. So every few months, um, we try to work with the community to either send out surveys or kind of see, see what they're interested in and, and throw events where, you know, you answer some questions, you contribute in some way, and you either win swag or you win um, an orca not. Uh, so that's also intentional. Uh, we're not, you know, airdropping uh, orca like crazy. First of all, the orca become belongs to the DAO and the community. So we do not have a say in like, you know, air dropping like crazy. Um, but second of all, this is also incentivizing more kind of more like behavior that is less driven by token price only. Uh, in order for a community to have longevity, it can't be kind of, of course, it will be impacted by, 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 by crypto, uh, you know, market and token prices. Um, but being a place where they can come and they feel like they're welcomed, they can receive the answers they're looking for. They are kind of being treated like equals and being, being, being seen as a part of something is also very important. So we intentionally, you know, like the framing, the structuring and the incentives to try to build, build that culture with the community. Yeah. No, I, it's, it's a simple thing, kind of just the it reframing, is. but it, it's rather brilliant and just kind of reshaping the thoughts going into it, how much that can actually do for the community, the project, and even the product itself. Um, it is rather remarkable. In terms of, I would say, Workum has particularly focused on the design aspect of the product, which I think in crypto is still still needs lots of love and orca because of the because of great framing uh, of, of your statement <laughs> yes still needs lots of love but orca is focused on it has really kind of separated it it's from the pack i know as head of growth the product is also something that you think about talking with the community side can you maybe speak a little bit to just how you think about the design of the product and why the team has really focused so much on the design aspects, even with relaunching Orca and the new Orca, the design of the product was really front and center and just making it as easy and as simple to use as possible. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if this is one thing that I can speak a lot about because the design aspect was really Ori. Um, so I think the, the DNA of Orca, uh, at least on the product side, is still very much the DNA of the two founders combined. So uh, Utaro is the smart contract uh, designer uh, and, 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 and developer. And then Ori is the one that thinks about design, how that goes into the product itself. Um, but something that is interesting is um, the user experience of a product actually it. It starts with the product. Uh, well, actually, it exists within the product, but it starts and it ends somewhere else, uh, at least in crypto Twitter. Uh, it starts and ends, could be in Twitter, could be in Discord, right? It could be in, in ex extended into other products. So uh, those parts, depending on how you see it, um, are also designed in as a part of the user experience. So yeah. um, I think... So Ori's role back at IDEO and, and in her entire career journey has been about uh, interaction, interactive design and uh, user experience and, and product design. 
uh, my role has always been about actually organizational design or um, thinking about how an organization can fit together uh, to achieve the greater purpose of a uh, of a of a team or of of the founders, right? So um, design in that aspect is more about just like I said before, cultivating the the Twitter experience, the community experience, and actually also uh, the team itself, right? How are we all in different pockets or different sizes of communities rallying around the the, the founder's vision? Um, so it's not yeah. what I'm doing is not strictly product uh, related design, though. I guess maybe for you personally, then what what are have been some of your biggest learning lessons for designing the organizational experience within crypto within Web three uh, through these ups and downs through the different product iterations through the FUD? Just what are your biggest takeaways now being involved? on a fast-growing community, on a fast-growing product for the last couple of years? Yeah. Um, so when it comes to, so there's like fast and slow. So in crypto Twitter and in the Discord community, people forget really fast, right? So you, like crypto Twitter, I, I, I see like people reinventing themselves every two weeks or like every yeah. few days, you know, they previously maybe they didn't have a monkey PFP and then they put on a monkey PFP and all of a sudden they're part of the monkey community, for example. And that really helps them add credibility. Uh, but that could happen in a instant and no one's going to go back to Twitter and scroll through, you know, like a few months ago and see like what they really said before. So it is, that is, that is, easy and hard when it comes to shaping a brand it is easy because you can just change your crypt, uh, your twitter description and then people will believe exactly what you wrote in the in your twitter description but it's very difficult to create a long lasting image and also a trust trustworthy image um, because I think everyone is like DYOR, right? There is all of these FUD, all, a lot of rugs going on. It's really hard to trust. Um, so in one aspect, it's really fast for people to remember and forget and to like hype around something. Um, but it's very slow to build trust. And I think the trust has to happen in a more micro and in a more subtle way. So people in the community some of them turn over really quick. They come and they leave, right? They, they, they come and they're like, uh, when airdrop. And then if they don't receive a response, they will like go away probably. Um, but there are community members that stay for, I've seen community members that have stayed around for over two years. Um, and actually uh, someone that I spoke to in the community that asked the question over a year ago is one of Orca's DAO council members today. So in that sense, it is a slow process, talking to them, cultivating them and getting their trust and, and having that trust repaid by them joining and being a part of the DAO. Um, another way that uh, kind of that happens slowly or organizational things happen slowly is um, while the outside is changing, you want to retain stability within the team because the more um, turbulence that is happening outside, actually, the more the team needs to stay intact and to build and to have synergy. Um, and that means, and, and in addition to that, um, all of us, uh, different, all of our contributors are in different uh, locations, different area codes, different time zones. So once you spend the, the investment and the slow journey of building up the trust among these people. Many of them have not seen each other's faces, right? We, we try to do a lot of different things. We used to do a uh, weekly kickoff. We used to, you know, share different inspirations within the team. Uh, we do sometimes co-location where people have an opportunity to meet. But once you build that, it is, it is hard to, um, how do I put this? Um, as the organizational, as the organization's need evolves, um, you might need to make changes to the team, and the changes to the team um, could also have a long-lasting effect to to the trust that you've built slowly. Um, yeah, 
and 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 it's difficult to communicate uh, across time zones. A lot of things get lost in translation. So I would say uh, probably at least thirty percent of the time that I spent working at Orca is in uh, talking to team members. A lot of times one on one to make sure the message that comes from Ori or Yutaro or RGC uh, or myself are not kind of lost across time zones and, and translation and, and misunderstanding uh, to ensure yeah. that we yeah. can move together. Uh, well put. I think trust, whether it's in specifically within Web3 or in our daily lives, is paramount. And it takes a long time to build up and yeah. is kind of a slow but methodical thing that we have to build uh, for people that use our products and even on the investing side, like being able to build up your reputation as someone that's trustworthy and that provides value to the community. Uh, it's not easy. One thing yeah. that you mentioned though was kind of to an outsider that wants to get involved in Web3 or even uh, Twitter. There are monkey pictures, there are PFP pictures, there's rugs, there's smart contracts hacks. How do we build yeah. trust with the outside community that maybe is crypto curious, but is too afraid to actually put their hard-earned money on blockchains? Yeah. Um, so quickly going back to building trust within a team. So when a team feels like they have trust in each other, uh, and when a team feels like they're motivated to build something valuable that's bigger than themselves, it really shows in their external communication. Um, I, I would say, uh, and I can't guarantee it, but I feel pretty comfortable uh, making a statement that uh, anyone who's either been a part of Orca's uh, team of contributors uh, or is there right now, they're all very proud of having been or is currently a part of Orca. Um, and that shows when they are going to events, when they are, you know, talking on interviews, when they're talking in the community, uh, when they're tweeting about Orca, right? If you if you hear like how Light uh, talks about Orca, it really shows, and and that helps build brand. Um, it, it is a very slow way to do it, but it's a sustainable way to do it. Uh, and when it comes to people who are curious about putting their money in something crypto related, but they're really not sure who to trust. Um, I think there are a few, if they come into the community, they will feel it, right? But they could also go on, for example, Orca's uh, website and, or they can Google Orca Dex. And some of the things that they will see are Orca uh, donating, uh, ha having, having gathered over, I think, 1.6 million now uh, to donate to climate change initiatives. Uh, Orca having donated close to $1 million to help with crypto uh, financial literacy, crypto literacy uh, in developing nations. So these show that, and also they will find no news about Orca ever been hacked because Orca hasn't. Uh, there is two audits and there is a bug bounty. So these are all things that we're doing individually, but, but uh, like in different initiatives, but together they create an image of reliability and of trustworthiness. Um, something else that um, recently just happened is there was a white hat who identified a bug in one of Solana's old program libraries. Um, this happened, I think, maybe November of last year. Uh, but this was a Solana library that uh, Solana itself no longer upkept. Um, so there, was, uh, there wasn't a bug bounty right around that. Um, so this white hat reached out to a number of different products that was built on this program. Um, Orca, actually, uh, this part of Orca's product is now deprecated. So Orca is no longer, uh, I would say, technically built on this particular program. But um, this was an important piece of uh, kind of Orca's uh, initial, initial foundation, and it does impact other, other protocols. So Orca found it to be very important for this white hat to be rewarded. But there was no, it, it wasn't a part of Orca's bug bounty or Solana's bug bounty or anyone's bug bounty. Um, so the initial team uh, kind of brought this up to the DAO 
and ask for some money to be given to the white hat. Um, and we ended up, the DAO ended up agreeing to a hundred thousand USD uh, from the treasury mm -hmm. to be awarded to this white hat. So um, it's going back to how quickly uh, Twitter forgets. So when this white hat first identified the bug and kind of like talked about it, his tweet received, I think, 900 likes. And then when Orca kind of was able to find money and send it to him, his tweet received like 20 likes. So like it's been like a span of many months and people have already forgotten. But yeah. it doesn't matter because we wanted to do the right thing. We wanted to propose something that is reasonable, that shows all builders and hackers, you know, any kind of hackers out there that... Uh, Orca is committed to safety and reliability for the community. And yeah. if anyone Googles or searches, that is one little piece, little brick that builds to that image. Definitely. Brick by brick. Uh, it's yeah. a long journey. And I, I think what I appreciate about the team at Orca is you have the long-term future in mind and you're building with that as the future. And I, I think that's one of the hallmarks of companies uh, that ultimately achieve for greatness is that long-term mindset. And so super excited for what the Orca team is doing there and continuing to build trust. But maybe as we wrap up the podcast, what are you personally, KZ, looking forward to in 2023 or even 2024, whether it's Orca, some things uh, within crypto or even outside of the crypto landscape? Yeah, uh, I think two things. One is... Uh, I'm excited about more competition because if there's more competition, if there are stronger builders coming to Solana, it means people have more faith in Solana that they want to build here because they believe in a stronger future. Uh, and I, this is a question we we ask ourselves in the development team: like, what if Uniswap comes tomorrow, right? To to build a, a, a Dex, um, it could be it could be Uni, it could be anyone else, right? But uh, competition makes teams more resilient if we manage it right. Uh, and competition motivates the team to build better, uh, build stronger. So I'm excited about that. And, and because that also means more and more on-chain liquidity, right? Um, as you see on like Jupiter or anything else, uh, more on-chain liquidity means more liquidity and trading facilities through Orca. So, so it's great for everyone involved. Um, so I'm excited about competition. Uh, and the second thing I'm excited about is um, I, I see a shortage of, I don't have the right framing for it yet. I don't have the right word for it yet, but maybe like, um, like executive coaching or like management coaching in Web3. So like, you know, in coaching and executive coaching is something that exists in, in Web2 and in any traditional uh, industries where someone who's had experience working in that industry can come and teach you, you know, where they've been and, and how to how to do it better. Uh, and a lot of the skills that they teach are are kind of mental models, thinking, soft skills, things like that. Not so much on kind of more expertise, like how to calculate something or how to code something. Um, but as teams develop, as the teams scale and grow. Uh, executive coaching or like just general management understanding is very much needed. Um, but because there is a lot of industry lingo in Web3, um, those seasoned coaches have not really like bridged over to to speak those Web3 lingo to these very ambitious, very smart, but also very young leaders in Web3. Um, so uh, I'm thinking about writing a bit more like in this in this area to hopefully help with uh, leaders who are trying to lead a team, scale a team, uh, scale a product that uh, may not have uh, resources that kind of help them put these like best practices into Web3 language uh, to, to teach them the way. Um, I went to a few hacker houses and did a few office hours. And a lot of the questions that I got from these office hours are, you know, I got funding, who do I hire? Or oh, now I hire some people, but like, I don't know how to train them or I don't know what to tell them about what to do, right? I just tell them to like grow the community or like do marketing, but I don't really know, you know, what, what else to say to them. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of details lacking and 
Um, I've been really slow at writing my tweet threads, but um, hopefully, uh, so I'm excited about kind of maybe putting more more uh, content out there to see if they're helpful for the community. Amazing. I look forward to reading that content, KZ. I think uh, whether it's the Web3 community or even just operational excellence that you've instilled at Orca in building this decentralized organization uh, and the product suite that Orca team has built out. Uh, I think we would all very much appreciate your writings and look forward to seeing more of them on the timeline or longer thread posts. But uh, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I truly appreciate uh, you sharing some of your wisdom, the operational excellence that you've built up and the small details of what it takes to build a great product and a great community. Uh, it's not easy within crypto. As we talked about, there's lots of ups and downs, but uh, you and the team have been navigating the water and really appreciate the insights that you shared. Thank you. Thank you so much, Logan, for always supporting Orca and for, for being very consistent in what you do as well. Um, I saw the new tweet that came out recently, so you you will start to use your own voice in different ways now, right? I think whether it's Web3 or in life, finding your own voice is probably one of the most hardest challenges. And so I'm yeah. uh, going to share some of more of my opinions, but uh, awesome. no, I, I appreciate uh, you coming on again. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, looking forward to reading more from you as well. And thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you.